Whistler. I am the Whistler. And I know many things before I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Garvey's Folly. The opening night of the play, Bleak House Lights, was a gay and festive time for the Broadway first-nighters crowding the theater. But for Paul Garvey, the handsome and distinguished director-producer of the play, it was the most crucial night of his career. Yes, your last two plays have been dismal failures, haven't they, Paul? And you've sunk everything you have in tonight's production to try to make a comeback. You're tense as you talk to Jessica Marlin, your leading lady, before the curtain goes up. Remember now to take your hand from the mantelpiece before James tells you he's through. I will, darling. And after he leaves and slams the door, take a long look at the fireplace before you start to smile or make the slightest move. I know. Don't worry. And give the best performance of your life. I will, Paul. I hope it's a hit for both our sakes. We need it. It will be. I know it will be. I feel it, too. Like when we first met. Remember? Mm. You were just a stage-struck kid. And how much in love we were. Were? And still are. Oh, it's wonderful to be back together again. This time, nothing will come between us. Except your wife. Me. Go on, Miss Marlin. Good luck, Jessica. For both of us, darling. Yes? Paul. Come in. Hello, darling. Well, did you read them? The reviews? Yes, but the audience told me all I had to know. It was a turkey, Paul. No, I don't care what they say. This one has to go. Everything I have is sunk in it. It's a flop, Paul. Your third one in a row. Well, what happens to my career now? You can make a comeback, Jessica. How? Listen to Bryson's review in the world. Jessica Marlin has a pretty face and that's all. She handles her lines like a high school girl in her first amateur play. Bryson is just a vicious fool. Don't pay any attention to him. What about the other critics? Would you like for me to quote them? No. Ignore the whole pack. Somehow we'll make another comeback together, darling. Do whatever you wish, Paul. I'm through. Thanks to your excellent direction. My direction? Now, that's a fine thing to say. I expected the playwright to blame me and my backers, too, but not you, Jessica. What do you want? Praise? No. Just consideration. Then why didn't you listen to people occasionally instead of being so stubborn? As a director, I had to call it the way I saw it. How noble. All right. This one was a flop. The next one will be a hit. That's show business. That's just why I'm getting out. Oh, don't be silly, Jessica. You're bitten. You can't get out. What about us, darling? I'm going back to Cleveland. I'm sorry. And marry the department store owner? What's his name? Jim Daniels? Yes, at least he's not just using me. Jessica, you're not made to be an ordinary housefrau. You belong in the theater and you belong with me. Darling, don't do anything you'd be sorry for for the rest of your life. I'll never be sorry I quit this jungle. And if you take my advice, you'll do the same and go home. Live the kind of life your wife wants you to. <laughs> Your play closes after a two-week run. But you still don't take Jessica's advice. You can't accept defeat, Paul. Your one thought is to prove you're still the brilliant Broadway producer-director of yesterday and to bring Jessica back to you. But it looks hopeless, Paul. And then a few days later, as you sit alone in your office reading the morning paper, you notice a small news item on the bottom of the drama page. Elliot Forbes, prize-winning playwright, told reporters at his suite in the Atlantic Hotel that producers have turned down his latest play, Island Night, as being too unusual and too tragic for public taste. Well, just what I've been waiting for. Nice of you to drop by, Mr. Forbes. Now, what do you have? Mm, brandy will be fine. Brandy it is. I like scotch over ice myself. Hmm? Yeah. Here you are. Thank you. 
Now then, about Island Night. It's your greatest play, Elliot. If you don't mind the first name. Of course not. I, uh, I'm sure it's an artistic success, but nobody will touch it. Everyone says it's poor box office. O'Neill and Ibsen managed to fill the theater. I don't see why we can't do it with this one. You're seriously interested in putting it on? I wouldn't have asked you to come and see me if I weren't interested. Where are you going to find financial backing? This thing is being turned down by every angel in New York. It won't be easy, Elliot. But if you'll give me a 90-day option on the play, I'll do my best. Hmm? I've got nothing to lose. Go right ahead. And good luck. Your option on Elliot Forbes' play gives you the fighting chance you've been looking for. You phone Jessica, but she's not at home to you. Finally, in desperation, you go straight to her apartment. Oh, it's you. Yes. Aren't you going to ask me in? I suppose so. Thanks. What brings you here, Paul? I want your opinion on a play, Jessica. I might have known. The answer is no. This play is going to make theater history. You're wasting your time. I'm leaving for Cleveland Friday morning. I'm only asking you to read the play. If you want to leave after that, I won't say another word. Fair enough. Who wrote this new masterpiece? Elliot Forbes. The Elliot Forbes? Exactly. And he's letting you produce and direct it? There are some people who still have faith in me, Jessica, who don't judge a man by his failures alone. Meaning me, I guess you're right. All right, Paul, I'll read the play. Do it soon, Jessica. Any number of actresses are after the lead. I can't put them off forever. me three times this morning. Oh, I'm here now. Did you read the play? Oh, yes. It's breathtaking. You're right. It will be an American classic. And the way I'm going to handle it, it's going to be a smash at the box office, too. The part of it I am. You are thinking of me, aren't you, Paul? What about Cleveland and Jim Daniels? I don't want you walking out on me, Jessica. I've put Cleveland on ice. Then the part's yours. It always was, really. Oh, darling, I can't wait to get in rehearsal. I'm in love with you all over again. I guess I never learn. So far, it's been easy, Paul. You have Jessica back, and you have a great play to star her in. All you need now is the money. But that proves more difficult. You try all your old backers, but they won't have any part of the play, or you. But you still hold an ace in reserve. Your wealthy wife, Dorothy. You feel sure you still know the way to her heart. You don't even go into the city for several days. Stay at the modest house out on Staten Island, which Dorothy insisted on buying shortly after your marriage. A house you despise. Situated a mile from the main road and almost a half mile from the little traveled side road leading to your driveway, seems to you like the end of nowhere. But it's Dorothy's idea of perfection. For the next few days, you even pretend to like it. And a few evenings later, as you and Dorothy are sitting on the veranda. It's lovely out here, isn't it, Paul? Yes, it is. I've never realized before how nice it is. Oh, why can't it always be this way, Paul? Uh, let's not dwell on the past. I can't help it. What happened to us, Paul? What happened to our marriage? I don't know. Well, surely you must have thought about it. I have. To be honest, I never felt you cared about me or my problems. Well, what do you mean? Well, right now, for instance, I'm having trouble raising money for my next production. If I thought you cared at all... How much do you need this time? Fifty thousand. Oh? Is that why you've been so nice to me? <laughs> you know, that's not true. Yes, it is. It's always the same thing. The theater. The theater. All right, Dorothy, I've stayed struck. That's the way it is. Oh, Paul, isn't it time you grew up? No. You know what they call your last wonderful production? Garvey's Folly. When Island Night opens, those words will stick in their throats. It's a great play. They're always great plays, Paul. I thought you were interested in saving our marriage, not running me down. I want you to come to your senses. All right. Finance Island Night. And if it fails, I'll leave the theater forever. I'm not interested. Well, you should be. This play will put me back on top. Then why don't you get the money from Jessica Marlin? I know all about her, Paul. I'm not as blind as you think I am. Believe me, there's nothing between us. Oh, I wish I could believe you. You can. And honestly, Dorothy, I, I'm desperate, or I wouldn't have asked you. I can't help it, Paul. I'm not financing your stage door romances any longer.
persuade your wife Dorothy's refusal to back your production of Island Night. All your plans go up in smoke. You stall Jessica as long as you can. But as the weeks pass, she becomes suspicious and begins putting on more and more pressure. You're desperate, Paul, ready to clutch at any straw. And then one evening, you're walking into your old friend Chip Edwards' bar. Remember me? Hey, Paul! What do you know, fellas? Gee, it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. What do you have? It's on the house. Uh, scotch. Coming up. Couple of scotches, Jack. Hey, you're looking beat, Paul. I am. What's new out this way? No, just a local political campaign. Mm. Gonna have an election to get us a new mayor. The old one passed away. I'm back in one candidate pretty heavily. I wish I could worry about local elections for a change. What's bothering you, Paul? Money. I need $50,000 or I'm finished, Chip. Oh, if I had it... You don't, so forget it. But I sure wish I knew where I could get my hands on it. I wish there was some way I could help, Paul. Mm. If I live to be a million years old, I'll never forget the way you risked your life to save me from drowning last summer. Forget it, Chip. If I'd stopped to think, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> anyway, you did it. I just don't forget a thing like that. I'll do anything to help you, Paul, if I could. Anything. I know you would, Chip. And I won't forget that, either. That evening when you return home, you find a note from Dorothy saying she'd gone to attend a meeting of the District Property Owners Association and will return around 10.30. As you pace the floor and nervously smoke one cigarette after another, an idea suddenly hits you. An idea that could be the solution to your problem. You open the wall safe in your living room. Remove several of Dorothy's most valuable pieces of jewelry. Take them to the attic. Then you open an old theater trunk that no one has touched for years. Shuffle through its contents. Finally, you find exactly what you want. A large jar of makeup cream. You carefully embed the jewelry into the makeup cream. And then place the jar on the bottom of the trunk. Cover it with old costumes and close the lid. You're sure the police will not suspect you. And even if they do... You're certain your hiding place will never be discovered. When you return to the living room, you leave the wall safe open, overturn a few chairs, set the scene to look like a burglary. Then you pick up the phone and call the police. This is Paul Garvey, 21 Kenter Road. I just returned home and found my wall safe broken into, all our valuables missing. <laughs> Checked everything. Thank you for your cooperation. Oh, I'm so glad I wasn't here when it happened, officer. I just got home a few moments ago. Nothing to worry about now, Mrs. Garvey. But I always felt that we were, well, so safe out here. Didn't you, Paul? Yes, I did. Well, thank heavens they didn't get our antique silver in the main vases. Those could never be replaced. Mr. Garvey probably scared them off when he came home. Hope your jewels were insured. Oh, yes. We've been paying premiums for years. Just file your claim there, Mr. Garvey, and I'm sure you won't have any trouble. Thank you, officer. I'll do that first thing in the morning. When the check for $47,000 arrives from the insurance company a month later, made out to Mr. and Mrs. Paul Garvey, you get your wife, Dorothy, to endorse it. But instead of depositing it in the bank to her account, you conveniently put it in your own. And then you start rolling on the production of Island Night. The storm breaks a few nights later. You arrive home from a late rehearsal when Dorothy meets you at the door. Hello, Paul. Hello, my dear. Uh, a little late for you to be up, isn't it? I've been waiting for you. Oh? Nothing the matter, I hope. I went to the bank today, Paul. I want to know what you did with that check from the insurance company. I... I thought it over carefully, Dorothy, and, and... And and what? I... I decided to use the money. That was my money, Paul. Ours, darling. The insurance check was made out to both of us. I won't permit you to throw away $47,000 on that Jessica Marlin and that ridiculous play. I'll report you to the insurance company. You might cause trouble, but I don't think so, Dorothy. It's our money, not yours. I'm the head of the house, and I consider it a wise investment in our future. Do you? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there isn't going to be any future, Paul. I'm filing for a divorce. (laughs) 
You're secretly pleased with Dorothy's decision ending your marriage. You pack a bag and take a hotel room near the theater until you can move all your belongings to larger quarters. Meanwhile, you work around the clock getting Elliot's play into shape. You don't mind it, Paul, because it brings you and Jessica closer together. And then one afternoon, the unexpected happens. You're at the theater giving the cast last-minute instructions before taking the play for the usual out-of-town tryout. Quiet, cast. Quiet. Quiet, please. The run-through was fine. Uh, we need a little more voice projection on the quiet scenes. Um, on the lights. We still have too much pink in the big spotlight. Jessica, nice job. Never saw so much tenderness in the love scenes before. Thanks, darling. Okay, take the afternoon off. But remember, we all catch the six o'clock train to New Haven. We'll have a dress rehearsal tonight at the theater so we can rest tomorrow for the opening night tomorrow night. I'll see you all at six. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, I'll get it. So long, everybody. Hello? Paul? Yes? I must see you immediately. I'm busy, Dorothy. I have a train to catch at six. It's a matter of considerable urgency, Paul. What is it? I shall discuss it with you in person. If you can tear yourself away long enough to drive out here. And you'd better, Paul. If not, I'm warning you, you'll be sorry. And you'd better hurry. <laughs> was so urgent, Dorothy. Only these. How did you find that jewelry? I decided to clear out the attic of all that old junk of yours. And when I emptied the contents of that old trunk, a big makeup jar dropped and broke. Well, it fell all to pieces. What do you propose to do about it? Well, that's up to you, Paul. What do you mean by that? If you're ready to give up the theater and Jessica Marlin, I'm willing to tell the insurance company that we found the jewelry. I will refund the $47,000 and forget the whole thing. And I'll start over again with you. And if I'm not ready? Then I shall have to tell the insurance people the true story. Why not be sensible, Dorothy? The theater's my life. I can't... You're a up. failure in the theater, Paul. I've given you five years to prove yourself. I'm sorry, Paul, but you have exactly two choices. Oh, no. There's one more. Paul! Oh. No! You go completely out of your mind, don't you, Paul? For several seconds, you stand stunned as you realize the blow you struck with the heavy bookend in your blind anger was fatal to your wife, Dorothy. But there's no turning back the clock now. You realize you must cover yourself, make the whole thing appear as a robbery and murder by outsiders. You open a window, quickly gather up the silverware, a valuable Ming vase, and several highly expensive antiques. Then you put them in a suitcase. For the first time, you're grateful that the house Dorothy insisted on buying is off the beaten path, away from even the side roads. You're certain no one saw you arrive, and equally certain no one will see you leave. You decide to take the Staten Island Ferry to Manhattan. A few moments after the ferry is underway, the suitcase has been tossed overboard. Once in Manhattan, you park your car as usual, hurry to the station, and join the cast for the trip to New Haven. And that evening... As you start the dress rehearsal. Places. Places, please. Let's, uh, let's, uh, take it through from the beginning and make it good. Now, let's go. Excuse me, Paul. There's someone outside who wants to see you. He says it's urgent. Oh, thanks, Rizzy. Okay, sorry. Hold it, everyone. Keep your places. I'll be back in a few minutes. Hello. Mr. Garvey? Yes. I'm Detective Sergeant Anderson. What is it? Uh, your wife was found murdered this afternoon in your home on Staten Island. Dorothy? Dead? Well, I can't believe it. Who would want to harm Dorothy? Well, apparently she was killed during a robbery. The place seems to have been pretty well ransacked. Well, it just seems impossible. You and your wife were separated recently, weren't you? Yes. But it wasn't really serious. No, I see. Were you home any time this afternoon, say between two and four? No, no, I, I wasn't. Ah, then where were you? Can you tell us? Well, uh, after the rehearsal this morning, I, I had lunch. I uh, gave the script a final going over. Uh -huh. I went over to Chip Edwards' bar in Brookhurst. Had a few drinks. That's uh, Chip Edwards' bar in Brookhurst. 
Yes, yes, I, I was there all afternoon. Chip Edwards himself will tell you so. We had a couple of drinks together. Oh. Uh, but why all the questions? Surely you don't suspect me. No, no. Of course not, Mr. Garvey. It's just routine. Oh, well, naturally, we'll have to drop in on Mr. Edwards and check your story. Well, naturally. I want you to. If you have the slightest suspicion. We haven't. As I say, this is just routine. I thank you for your cooperation, Mr. Garvey. You smile as the police leave. For you're certain that Chip Edwards, the man whose life you once saved, will give you an alibi the police won't be able to break, even though he has to lie to do it. You put in a long-distance call to his place in Brookhurst and breathe a sigh of relief as you hear his voice on the other end of the line. Chip Edwards, bar. Hello, Chip. This is Paul. I want you to do me a big favor. It's very important. Anything, Paul. You know that? The police are on their way to your place. The, the police? What for? They want to ask you some questions. I just want to refresh your memory. I was at your bar today before 2 and stayed there all afternoon till about 4.30. You do remember that, don't you? Yeah, wait a minute, Paul. I can't talk now, Chip. You understand that? No, Paul, I can't do it. What do you mean you can't do it? You said you'd do anything for me. I would, but what you're asking is not possible. Why not? Because we had a special election for mayor in Brookhurst today. All the bars were closed. We didn't open until the polling places were shut down at 7 tonight. I'm sorry, Paul. The Whistler. 